Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and this is the seventh episode of my series on the Hermetica. So in this episode, episode number seven, we're going to be looking at two chapters from the Hermetica. One is called Man is a Marvel, and the other is called The Zodiac and Destiny. Now, if you're listening to this for the first time, you may want to go back and check out the first six episodes of this series. Any of the episodes can be listened to on their own, but many of the concepts are building on one another sequentially, and so things will make more sense in later episodes if you've listened to the prior first episode. So I do recommend starting from the beginning. Plus, then you get a cool historical overview and a, a sense of why we're endeavoring to learn about all of this in the first place. So uh, let's go ahead and um, start. I'm going to put uh, the presentation up on the screen where you can see it. Uh, so two topics today from the uh, Hermetica, Man is a Marvel and the Zodiac and Destiny. Now the purpose of this series in brief, I mentioned this at the beginning of every talk, is to expose students of Western astrology to the philosophy of Hermes. Why? Because uh, many of the ancient Hellenistic source texts, the dawn of horoscopic astrology, uh, point to Hermes Trismegistus as the legendary founder of the uh, art of horoscopic astrology. And so uh, hermetic philosophy, the philosophy attributed to the same character, Hermes Trismegistus, is incredibly important to us as astrologers. We want to know why are we doing astrology in the first place? What is the metaphysical and spiritual reason for doing astrology? And the Hermetica um, gives us some very deep insights into these topics and questions. So we're working our way through a particular version of the Hermetica, which I'll hold up so you can see. It is the uh, Hermetica, the wisdom, the Lost Wisdom of the Pharaohs by Timothy Freck and Peter Gandy. It's from Tartar, the Tartar Cornerstone Edition text. Um, I published my first book with Tartar, so I have a soft spot in my heart for them, and I like this series. They do a really nice job presenting sacred uh, texts. This is a nice edition of the Hermetica because it consolidates a lot of uh, wisdom from the Hermetica that is presented in the form of very dense dialogues, are very philosophical and heady, and shortens them into uh, concise little chapters with, in poetry and prose. A lot of information packed in uh, for beginners, and I think it's really nice if you're uh, kind of being exposed to Hermetic philosophy for the first time. So if you're a really advanced student of Hermetic philosophy and you're listening to this, you know, this might not float your boat. Uh, but I think it's very accessible and it's very, I think it's very deep. So uh, I don't think you'll be l losing any depth in the process of listening to this series either. As we go along, we're reading through two chapters at a time. So I, today, today, Man is a Marvel and the Zodiac and Destiny. Um, but we've been building through a, a lot of previous chapters on a lot of different topics. So as I said, you may want to start from the beginning if you haven't already. As we go through, I read each chapter aloud, and then we explore the philosophical ramifications of each uh, section. We're taking a look at this in order to ask ourselves, what is the philosophical uh, basis of astrology, <clears throat> and what is the spiritual purpose of astrology? And this is something that I like to do in addition to presenting things like daily horoscopes or forecasts or monthly sun and rising sign columns, because it reminds us of why we're why we're doing what we're doing, why, we're in, why we should be interested in astrology, where is it all leading us, what did the ancient mystics think about all of this stuff. So today, the first chapter we're reading is called Man is a Marvel, and Hermes in this chapter is trying to give us an understanding of why the human birth and the human form is so unique and so important, and therefore should be used in the right way. So let's take a look. I'm going to read the Man is a Marvel chapter. There's two chapters today. Again, oh, as always, the first chapter is longer. The second chapter is very short. So here we go. Man is a Marvel. Atum is first. The cosmos is second. And man is third. Atum is one. The cosmos is one. And so is man. For like the cosmos, he is a whole made up of different diverse parts. The maker made man to govern with him, and if man accepts this function fully, he becomes a vehicle of order in the cosmos. Man may know himself and so know the cosmos by being aware. Aware that he is an image of a tum and of the cosmos. 
he differs from other living things in that he possesses mind. Through mind, he may commune with the cosmos, which is the second God, and by thought, he may come to knowledge of Atum, the one God. The human body encloses pure mind as if within a walled garden, which shelters and secludes it so that it may live in peace. Man has this twofold nature. In his body, he is mortal, and in his intelligence, he is immortal. He is exalted above heaven, but is born a slave to destiny. He is bisexual, and his father is bisexual. He is sleepless, as his father is sleepless. Yet he is dominated by carnal desires and lost in forgetfulness. Of all beings that have soul, only man has a twofold nature. One part, called the image of Atum, is single, undivided, spiritual, and eternal. The other part is made of the four material elements. One comes from the primal mind. It has the power of the creator and is able to know Atum. The other part, the other is put in man by the revolutions of the heavens. Man is the most divine of all beings, for amongst all living things, Atum associates with him only, speaking to him in dreams at night, foretelling the future for him in the flight of birds, the bowels of beasts, and the whispering oak. All other living things inhabit only one part of the cosmos, fishes in water, animals on the earth, birds in the air. Man penetrates all of these elements. With his sense of sight, he even grasps the heavens. To speak without fear, human beings are above the gods of heaven or at least their equal. For the gods will never pass their celestial boundaries and descend to earth, but a man may ascend to heaven, and what is more, he may do so without leaving the earth. So vast an expanse can his power encompass. By Atum's will, humankind is compacted of both divinity and mortality. He is more than merely mortal and greater than the purely immortal. Man is a marvel, do honor and reverence. He takes on the attributes of the gods, as if he were one of their number. He is familiar with the gods because he knows he springs from the same source. He raises reverent eyes to heaven above and tends the earth below. He is blessed by being the intermediary. He loves all below him and is loved by all above him. Confident of his divinity, he throws off his solely human nature. He has access to all. His keenness of thought descends to the depths of the sea. Heaven is not too high for the reach of his wisdom. His quick wits penetrate the elements. Air cannot blind his mental vision with its thickest fog. Dense earth cannot impede him. Deep water cannot blur his gaze. Man is all things. Man is everywhere. Man not only receives the light of divine life, but gives it as well. He not only ascends to God, but even creates gods, just as Atum has willed that the inner man may be created in his likeness. So we on earth create the gods in our human image. Is this not worthy of wonder? There are then these three, Atum, Cosmos, Man. <clears throat> the Cosmos is contained by Atum. Man is contained by the Cosmos. The Cosmos is the son of Atum. Man is the son of the Cosmos and the grandson, so to speak, of Atum. Atum does not ignore man, but acknowledges him fully as he wishes to be acknowledged by man. For this alone is man's purpose and salvation, the ascent to heaven and the knowledge of Atum. So here in this chapter, we have Hermes spelling out for us what makes a uh, human being so interesting and so special in creation, in all of the different beings that inhabit the earth. Um, and um, First, we have this idea, again, that um, Atum is a whole and complete unit. The cosmos, which is called the second god, is also a whole and complete unit. Within the cosmos is man, which is also a whole and complete unit, though made of different parts. So there is an emphasis on simultaneous and inconceivable oneness and difference. I am not you, and you are not me, right? We are individual spirit souls, unique, eternally, but also comprised on another level of the same spiritual essence. So there's sameness and there's difference. And this is set up throughout the entire 
framework of creation from God through the cosmos down to individual beings. Um, there is a co-creative capacity, Hermes tells us, that's built into the cosmos and man, but it's only there if he accepts this function fully. It is implied, therefore, that we have a choice, that our free will can be used to accept our role as a part of the divine whole, as a part of a relationship with divinity, in which case we may become co-creative. Uh, but we may also reject that. That's what's implied here. Man may know himself and know the cosmos by being aware that he is an image of Atom and of the cosmos. So how do we come to know that we are co-creators and how, how do we come to participate in some kind of divine play or divine relationship with the whole? It begins, Hermes tells us, by knowing that we are uh, an image of the whole, that we are created in the same image or likeness of the cosmos and the cosmos of God. And in that knowledge of who we really are, we may come to uh, serve as instruments or integral parts of the flow of creation. And being aligned with that brings us happiness. And this is something we see in both Eastern and Western philosophy, mystic uh, philosophy, of course, I'm not talking about like modern rational philosophy. Man possesses mind, which makes him unique. Through mind, he can commune with the cosmos and also come to knowledge of Atom. So how is it that we come to understand that we share in this divinity with the cosmos and the cosmos with God? It, that we're each wholes, but each different, uh, each whole and different, but all part of the same thing. How do we come to know that? It's through the unique capacity of mind that human beings are endowed with. And this is something that's said to be unique. Other species of life don't have the same capacity that we do in terms of being able to um, reflect on this and consciously um, uh, recognize our true nature. Uh, so um, it's that's no and that's no diss to any other forms of life, obviously either. But I'll never forget the first time I was kind of getting into spiritual things and I was listening to some talks from the Dalai Lama, I don't know, like 15 years ago or something. And I remember, um, I remember the Dalai Lama giving a talk on why the human form of life was really rare. And he said that you could think about it like if you were to pop up from underneath the water in the ocean and just so happen to come up through the middle of a life preserver, that this is something like the, the rarity and specialness of a human form of life because you are given the faculty of mind by which you can come to understand the truth and that the truth is liberating. The truth, um, the truth frees us into and, and brings us into our divine uh, communion. So um, we come to, through this knowledge that we have in the mind, we come to commune with the cosmos and also come to the knowledge of Atum. However, Hermes tells us that the mind is secluded. It's like a secret garden that's hidden away inside of us. And most people don't really care about it or have access to it or even know that it's really there. Um, we think of the mind a lot of the times just as a crude biological instrument. But what Hermes is talking about is not just like your brain, like some lump of matter with things firing off. He's talking about a uh, higher consciousness that can be perceived through the unique apparatus of our intelligence. And um, it's, the, it's covered. In the, in the East, we talk about how the true nature is, is covered as smoke covers a fire uh, or as the, the, the internal you know, beams uh, of a house are, are are covered by the walls and layers of things that you can't you can't see the the internal stuff. Well, similarly, it's hard to get to know this higher intelligence because it's covered, it's secluded, it's in a secret, safe, beautiful, serene place. It's ever pure in uh, the the mind or pure consciousness. Uh, when it's cleaned, right? When you kind of clean the mirror of the mind, you start to start to see within the mind your true nature, which is pure and pristine. So the image of this kind of the, the, the mind being hidden, the, the, the pure and spotless 
eternal soul that we are uh, can be reflected by the mind, but that it's hidden. Um, of course, this, this is the case when we look at almost all mystical traditions on the planet tell us that in order to uh, commune with divinity, we need things like silence, prayer, mindfulness, worship, contemplation, right? Because in order to enter the secret garden of pure mind and to see reflected in the, the wishing pool of the pure mind, the spotless soul, uh, we have to do a little work to get there. It's not easy. Um, we have a twofold nature, Hermes tells us. We're both mortal and immortal. It tells us that we are exalted above heaven, but born a slave to destiny. So even though we are these eternal spirit souls, the situation that we're in is that we're also in a mortal body that will die someday that's impermanent, and we're in a material world that's always changing and also impermanent. And insofar as we are identified with that material world, we're subject to the cycles of change and the laws that govern the cycles of change in the material world, which is not really very free. Um, Hermes also tells us that human beings are bisexual just as our creator father is bisexual, which is very interesting because on the one hand, you have this idea of God as a father throughout the Hermetica, um, but only in so far as father is being used as a kind of metaphor for source, like, like the, the semen that comes from a man to procreate. But in so far as God is a source, God is also not to be literally thought of as male. So God is um, beyond genders, neither male nor female, or is both. Um, so are we. Our, in our essential nature, that's who we are, even though we may occupy temporary material forms that are more or less feminine or masculine, more or less male or female, or whatever. Human beings are sleepless like a tum, which means we don't fall asleep and we don't wake up. We're eternally present and aware in our true nature. And yet, we're dominated by desires and lost in forgetfulness, so it's as though we are asleep. This is also getting to that piece about going back to the mind being hidden as in a secret garden, the pure mind that reflects the pure soul or spirit. So of all ensouled beings, man is unique because we have this twofold nature. And the twofold nature is both a blessing and a curse. Like all animals, all beings in creation, um, we, it's very easy to just be identified with material nature, hunger, mating, defending, sleeping, trying to get stuff, trying to, you know, trying to create some semblance of material happiness, doing the best we can, but really thinking there's not a lot more than this. or having no awareness that there is, or even being angry at the thought that there is. Um, but we also have this immortal nature. And the human being is unique in that it has the faculty to recognize both. And that's un that human beings are unique in a category of their own, so to speak, because of that. Um, and uh, so one part is spiritual and eternal. The other part is made of the elements. One part of us comes from primal mind and is endowed with free will and creative power, which is able to know our true nature. And the other is put in us by the revolutions of the heavens, which is to say that we are also born into the wheel of cause and effect and the material laws of nature and that we will be forced to work out a material destiny according to the laws of cause and effect by our DNA, our heredity, our karma, our genetics, our socioeconomic status, our historical situation, our racial or sexual orientation. All of these things plus our choices in a material sense create a story and it plays out and it has uh, it's, it's there's a there's a whole um, predictable uh, cycle that we will move through over and over and over, lifetime after lifetime. Insofar as we're identified with the material world, the cycles play out like this. And so that's one part of us. But then there's this other part of us that has this, this a different kind of free will. There's free will in the material world, like will I go eat here or will I go eat there? It's a kind of loose free will but it's always still a limited range of possibilities and the results of which will continue to play out in cycles of prediction, predictive, predictable action and uh, outcome and reaction like that. 
Um, the other kind of free will that we have is the capacity to inquire about who we really are. And that's thought to be our real free will. This is what Hermes is pointing to here. Man is most divine of all beings, Hermes says, because he can associate with the Tum. We have the, the real free will is the choice to say, who am I and where do, what, what do I really belong to? Where is my real place in creation? Autum is said to speak to human beings through omens and signs, through things like astrology, but also through nature and through natural occurrences, through dreams. We have unique ability to not only reflect upon who we are, but to actually share in communication with the divine through that same faculty, which is amazing. Um, and it's said that um, other beings, at the very least, have a much more diminished capacity for that sort of in intelligence, reflectiveness, and, and receptivity to, you know, it's not, it's not the same kind of self-conscious lucidity. It's different. And again, um, for me, when I first heard some of this earlier on in my studies, it was hard for me because I don't like, I don't like to look down upon other species of life, animals or anything. And I consider, you know, lots of animals to be quite intelligent or whatever. It's not that animals aren't intelligent or they don't have their own, um, uh, important place in, in creation. It's not that they're not ensouled and equally as valid and, and beautiful and, and sacred and divine as everything else. Hermes isn't saying that, but what he is saying is that the human lifetime for the sake of spiritual evolution is a gift and it should not be squandered because it's, it's a, you have a very unique capacity as a human. And I, I, after, over time, I have come to agree with that. So I'll leave it for you to think about, but this is definitely a part of the Hermetica. It's a big part of the yogic yoga philosophy as well. And again, uh, even, you know, Buddhist philosophy. All other beings inhabit one part of the cosmos, but man may occupy many places, even grasping heaven. But man has this inherent flexibility. Interestingly, um, it's said that the, the gods that operate, Hermes says that the gods that kind of uh, are like the administrators of the material universe, they're sort of making sure that everything runs in the way that it should. Right, like the uh, karmic administrators, they, they rule the flow of the universe. They're helping do that work. Um, they can't pass out of those roles and come down to earth, so to speak. Um, but a man can ascend to heaven and understand heavenly things, talk to gods, understand their workings, understand the supreme source from which we come from, and can do so while on earth, which is also thought to be a, a pretty unique range of flexibility, which is also why the human birth is said to be just incredibly precious and absolutely not to be squandered. Humankind is unique because it expresses thus both mortality and immortality. It has everything in creation, all ensouled beings are both mortal and immortal, right? But human form has the capacity to recognize both. So he keeps hammering home this point in this chapter. And human beings can take on attributes of heavenly things and earthly things simultaneously. And that's also thought to be a real um, kind of special status. Um, man knows that both he and the gods spring from the same source. So there's this weird way in which, for example, if you study archetypal psychology or astrology, you get to know the gods, right? And you can see them living in you in your conversations in your day-to-day -day life. And in a sense, you become friends with them. That's a really unique ability that the humans are kind of lowly compared to gods, but yet we can we kind of know what gods are up to. We kind of know what they do. We can kind of hang out with them, talk to them, relate with them, see them. That's amazing. And that's just another unique capacity. And we also know that we, even though we're respectful of the gods, which Hermes says, you know, if I speak without fear here for a minute, uh, then man is above the gods or equal to the gods, for he knows that they spring from the same source. This is very important because it turns that idea of hierarchy on its head a little bit. Normally the gods are up here, humans are down here, but actually for the sage who understands that um, if you know that you're a part of the same source as everything, then whether you're up here or down here doesn't really matter because it's not about how high you are, it's about knowledge of what you are. And so there's, the, there's this funny way in which Hermes is probably, in a sense, trying to remind people who long ago would have had such reverence for the gods and, in a sense, would have placed them in a, in a somewhat artificial hierarchy above themselves. 
yes, they're more powerful. Yes, they might be in charge of the rain or whatever else. And yes, you should, you know, be always respectful to other beings, which is speak of gods. But if you know that you spring from the same source, you know, ultimately that both you and the gods are part of the same thing that's higher than both of you. And you, you're, you're humble in your place. You know your place as, as a servant in this particular form, and you know something of the gods and can commune with them, right? It flips the hierarchy on its head a little bit. It says, you know, in that capacity, like it's, it's actually really, again, very unique to be human. So also uh, Hermes says that we can raise our eyes to heaven, but tend to earthly matters. So we can be, this is not... Some people, they hear the Hermetica and on first glance, they say, oh, it sounds like it's all about transcendence and spiritual bypassing. But no, it's, it's, it's actually a philosophy that's teaching us about how to make the material spiritual, how to make earthly things available for spiritual life. Um, but we have to really listen very carefully to the kind of riddles that Hermes weaves for us along the way in his teachings. Uh, in this sense, Hermes says he may become an intermediary. That is, we can commune with things that are both above and below. Of course, in the system of horoscopic astrology, Hermes, uh, Mercury, it rejoices in the first house, which is the middle point between the top hemisphere and the bottom hemisphere, what is above and what is below. And that's the place of Hermes. That's the place of the individual or the chart owner or the, the, the person who's birth or nativity we're actually looking at. So in a way, all of us are children of Hermes in the astrological tradition. Hermes is trying to tell us our place in creation, how unique and special it is, and how to make sure that we do the most with it. Um, confident of his divinity, he throws off his solely human nature, which is to say, w when we start building a confidence of what we really are, um, we we also naturally start to part ways with things that are so materialistic and the form of happiness that they provide so temporary and so fleeting that they only drag us down and make us suffer more over time. So this knowledge naturally helps us start to cast off forms of ignorance, attachment, and materialism that really don't make us happy. So, uh, Finally, he says, man not only receives the light of divinity, but gives it as well. So it's not just, oh, we're, we're down below, like give us some, you know, some, something of the higher stuff. So we also have the power to become a conduit for it. In that sense, what is below us and what is above us um, flow through us. And that is another very, thought to be a very sacred position. Um, so, uh, in, and I, I think the importance of repeating this over and over, it sounds kind of like you're going through a whirlpool of the same basic idea, but it's important to repeat it because we forget it. And Hermes tells us this straight up in this chapter. He says, people fall asleep. They forget how unique it is to be in this position because we don't really observe the world around us to see what other kinds of positions in the flow of, of, uh, reality the other beings are situated in, um, Sometimes, if we think about it, we might feel very alone in our position. Um, but what Hermes is telling us is that, you know, once, when you realize the position that you're in, you, you, the natural um, response is to become a conduit for sharing this knowledge because it, it will start to flow out from you and to others. Uh, this is why Jesus, for example, in uh, the New Testament, when, it, when it's asked, what is the greatest commandment? The first is to know and love God. The second is to share and distribute that love with others. The, Hermes is telling us roughly the same thing. We see the same thing reflected in many of the Shastras in India. And of course, we know that the Buddha has taught us very similar things as well. Um, so Hermes goes on to say this really interesting thing, which is that human beings can create gods in our own likeness. Is this not worthy of wonder? I love that this is mentioned in an ancient text because basically you have one of the earliest attempts to reconcile what would have likely been a lot of different conflicting pantheons of gods. Like, well, which gods are the real gods or which God controls this or that or whatever. And there's something here that Hermes is saying, which is that, um, recognition of the gods is diverse 
and is um, a part, also a part of what makes human beings so creatively unique is that the ability to uh, create gods um, through one's own, uh, in one's own image, in one's own culture or one's own place uh, is part of what makes human beings special as well. But you don't see Hermes saying that that doesn't mean that there aren't any gods or that they're fictitious or that they're not real or that there isn't a larger uh, hierarchy of gods uh, helping to create uh, flow in the universe. He doesn't say that. That he does say that we have the power to uh, create the gods in our own likeness, develop relationships with gods in our own likeness. So um, I think that's really, I mean, that's an amazing thing to just sit with. It's a pretty esoteric teaching, but at any rate, I'll let you guys think about that one on your own. Autum cosmos man. Autum Tum contains the cosmos, which is the second god. Cosmos contains man, and man is therefore the grandson of Autum. Now, this is the best part. Why is all of this happening? Hermes repeats it for us at the very close of the chapter. Autum does not ignore his creation, but acknowledges his creation from the cosmos, the second god, down to man uh, and individual beings, acknowledges them because he also wishes to be acknowledged. So what does that mean, acknowledge? The word acknowledge basically means to recognize and to know one another. And uh, coming with this throughout the Hermetica is not just to know, but to love. This is an intimate form of knowing. It's a personal form of knowing. And finally, he says, this alone is man's purpose and salvation. We have free will. We don't have to be co-creators. We don't have to know and love divinity. We don't have to. It's a choice. But this is the purpose for which all of this was made. Was So the choice exists so that it is possible for love to exist between God and creation, which is, in a sense, a, 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 a way of saying that uh, there are multiple aspects of God that are engaging of their own free will in loving God, right? So, but the choice has to be there. Otherwise, love isn't real. So this is really fascinating philosophy. And again, at the end, Hermes says, this is, this is man's purpose and salvation. All right, so we're going to read the next chapter on the Zodiac and Destiny now, which is a little shorter. But let's see where this goes now in terms of like, okay, man is so unique, right? We've got this whole chapter telling about just how unique the position of being human is um, and why we shouldn't squander the opportunity um, to be in this body. But then we have the next chapter telling us about the role that the Zodiac and Destiny plays in the human sphere of life. So this is called the Zodiac and Destiny. It's a much shorter chapter. When the creator had created this beautifully ordered universe, he wanted to order the world also. So he sent down man, a mortal creature, made in the image of an immortal being, to be an embellishment of the divine body of the cosmos. It is man's function to complete the work of a tum. He was made to view the universe with awe and wonder and to come to know its maker. At first, the heavenly gods complained, saying, you are being rash in creating humanity. They see with inquisitive eyes and hear what they have no right to hear. They reach out with audacious hands. They will dig up the roots of plants and investigate the properties of stones. They will dissect the lower animals and one another also. They will seek to discover how it is that they are alive and what is hidden within they will cut down the woods of their native land and sail across the sea to see what lies there. They will dig mines and search the uttermost depths of the earth. All this might be bearable, but they will do much more. They will press on to explore the world above, seeking by observation to discover the laws that govern the movements of the heavens. Atum replied, I will build the Zodiac, a secret mechanism in the stars, linking to unerring and inevitable fate. The lives of men from birth to final destruction shall be controlled by the hidden workings of this mechanism. And when the mechanism began to work, the keen-eyed goddess Destiny supervised and checked its movements. 
Through this mechanism, destiny and necessity are cemented together. Destiny sows the seed. Necessity compels the results. In the wake of destiny and necessity comes order, the interweaving of events in time. Atum implants each human soul in flesh by means of the gods who circle in heaven. It is man's lot to live his life according to the fate determined for him by these circling celestial powers, and then to pass away and be resolved into the elements. There are some whose name will live on through the memorials of their mighty handiwork, but the names of the many will fade into darkness. Few can escape their fate or guard against the terrible influence of the zodiac, for the stars are instruments of destiny, which bring all things to pass in the world of men. If, however, the rational part of a man's soul is illuminated by a single ray of Atum's light, the workings of these gods is as nothing, for all gods are powerless before the supreme light. But such men are few. Most are led and driven by the gods which govern earthly life, using our bodies as the instruments of destiny. To my way of thinking, however, it is our duty not simply to acquiesce in our human state, but through intense contemplation of divine things, to detach ourselves from our merely mortal nature. So another juicy chapter from Hermes here. Hermes is now telling us about the Zodiac and the subject of destiny and what role this plays in the unique life of a human being. He says that when the creator beautifully ordered the universe, he wanted to order the world also. And he saw human beings as this unique, uh, uh, creation that would have the opportunity to come to know its maker and endowed with creative power of its own could become cooperative uh, instruments in the unfolding of creation. Right away, now we get some complaints. The gods are like, wait a second. Um, people have choice. People have, they can make a choice and they can choose not to do that because they have these two contrary natures. And so uh, here's what's going to happen. Um, human beings are going to rebel and act selfishly. They're going to dominate, kill, devastate each other, the animals and the earth. They're going to seek power. They're going to seek to know where they came from and understand the laws. But the implication is for selfish reasons. They're going to have an inquisitive spirit, but mostly with a, a rebellious attitude I want to be the Lord of everything. I want to dominate. I want to consume, right? And the gods are like, are you sure this is a good idea? Because I don't see these people as going to, they're going to be your co-creators, right? I see them as they're going to, they're going to act probably very selfishly and be very exploitive. They're going to exploit nature and each other and going to dissect the animals and stuff like that. Now, Atum says, don't worry. I've got this thing called the Zodiac. It's a secret mechanism in the stars that's linked to unerring and inevitable fate, which means there's a law that I'm going to build into the cosmos. The lives of these people that have free will from birth to final destruction will be controlled by the hidden workings of this mechanism, which is to say that um, individual people will have the freedom to go out and exploit. It's true. They'll have the freedom to act selfishly, to kill one another, all of this stuff, right? But I will still maintain all of it and keep a certain kind of law, order, truth, goodness, justice through the workings of the Zodiac. I will, I'm going to govern the way that everything happens uh, in so far as people try to go and, uh, you know, they get really identified with their material nature. They get really selfish um, there's going to be consequences. There's going to be kind of a, a cosmic legal system at work. And if they, that's what they want to do, they will not be able to escape the workings of that mechanism. It will control their destiny and their fate. Their, their free will will only have a certain amount of rain, and there's going to be lessons and justice built into that cycle. right? It'll, and obviously, um, this is uh, an ancient view of the zodiac this is you know this is as old as astrology itself um he says keen-eyed goddess destiny supervises and checks the movements of this mechanism this is very important because sometimes people say i don't want to live in a universe a material universe it's just some kind of dry machine well 
there is some sense of there being laws and order and predictability. This is why the cycles of the heavens are associated with the, the law of karma that will govern us in our uh, human exploits. Um, however, goddess destiny gives a very personal feeling to all of this. this. There is a goddess that is in charge of all of this, and she's weaving things together in a way that's deeply personal, artful, meaningful, uh, beautiful even. So if we become students of karma, right, we become students of this wheel, this mechanism that's controlling all human exploits, especially remember, uh, these are, we're, we're only subject to this wheel insofar as we are, we are pursuing all of our selfish interests as though we are not a part of the divine whole. But insofar as we start studying this order, we come to see not just the, the dry laws, but the beauty and personality of those laws. That's why goddess destiny has her overview of the wheel. It has to be personal. It has to be, in a sense, like a mother who, is, uh, who cares about your educational process. I heard an astrologer recently say that every incarnation is like a, a therapy session. And that, that, that is conveying the same idea of goddess destiny being over, um, overseeing this, this set of laws and this turning of the wheel. Through this wheel and through destiny's supervision of it, destiny and necessity are cemented together. So necessity is like the hard law. And destiny is the unique, personal, artful way in which the hard law and the personal nature of each individual soul are brought together, which is what we read in a birth chart. Everybody that comes into a body is on some level working through certain kinds of human exploits and selfish endeavors, and they play out like Shakespearean dramas. They're very personal, very in intimate, and in many ways very beautiful. Um, but uh, that's what we're studying in a birth chart. Uh, and, and so there's necessity and destiny together at once. This is why birth charts are both concretely predictable. Every day of my life, when I see clients in a birth chart consultation, I can predict things like pregnancy or death. I'm not trying to brag. These are just things that happen. Pregnancy, death, and sit down with someone and say, wow, looks like you had a really um, major life-altering moment maybe to do with your health uh, when you were about 12 years old, oh yeah, I was in a near-death you know, car accident at that age. This kind of stuff happens to me so regularly, every day, very exactly, that I can't help but see necessity, that there is a cosmic law that's playing out. I'm not the judge. I don't understand it. It certainly doesn't always make sense to me. It doesn't even always appear to be that fair to me, but I see it working out predictably in charts all the time. And then I see that it's so highly personal, the lessons learned, the insights gained, so personal, uh, the, the way that destiny weaves something for each one of us. And it's, it's a necessary thing that we have to experience, but it's so personal. And that's the, the meeting of destiny and necessity. From the two comes order, the interweaving of events in time. Atum implants each human soul and flesh by means of the gods who circle in heaven. So this is all governed or looked over and ordained by the gods. That's the planets. Those are the, the planets. It is man's lot to live his life according to the fate determined for him by these circling celestial powers and then to pass away and be resolved into the elements. Some people will live on because they do really good stuff or they do stuff that's very memorable, but most people will never be remembered again. They'll be forgotten in time. They'll fade out. So in, again, Hermes really putting it down pretty hard for us. Now, insofar as we come to this world to just do human stuff, we're not at all interested in our divine nature. We're just going around on a wheel. The wheel is bound by necessity and laws that keep in check those selfish actions so that there's always reactions that we uh, experience as a result of them. They're all educational. They're all personal. They're all beautiful. They're all meant to facilitate the awakening of the soul, but we have free will and we can choose to be in ignorance of them perpetually, or we can choose to start inquiring, asking the right questions and seeking higher understanding. Um, he says, few can escape or guard against the terrible influence of the zodiac for the stars are instruments of destiny, right? So 
it's not a lot of people who can get out of this. Like they can't, you can't like wiggle your way free. And I hate to break it to everyone, but like there's only so much that, you know, gemstones and spells and magic and all of this stuff can do. You can't outsmart destiny. Um, if, de- if destiny and fate want to weave something in, then they will. And a lot of the times what we've learned uh, throughout the history of, you know, mysticism and, and occult studies is that people that try to escape fate in one place meet it in another, right? So uh, there's, no, there's no great celebration of remedial efforts in the Hermetica, meaning things that you can do to try and shift around you know, try to trick necessity or try to trick destiny. Um, that's not to, I'm not trying to say that, you know, I myself um, am very interested in herbalism and er, uh, herbal medicine tied to astrology. I have nothing against the uh, appropriate mindful use of gemstones or whatever. But you know what I'm talking about when people are like, oh, what can I do to, you know, get a Ferrari or whatever. So, The Zodiac brings all things to pass in the world of men, Hermes tells us. However, if the rational part of a man's soul is illuminated by even a single ray of Atum's light, the workings of these gods is as nothing, for all gods are powerless before the supreme light. Such men are few. So what we know is that to the the, the real purpose behind our life is to turn our intelligence to use our higher mind to rediscover who we are and to then become instruments of divine play, of divine creation. And we can, uh, by doing this, we have a way of spiritualizing the material stuff of our life. It, it, does, it no longer is just the rote spinning of the wheel of carnal desires and material existence. It becomes something more. And um, we have that capacity. We have to use our free will in order to access it. The deepest expression of that is, a, is uh, con- conceptualized as a relationship of love with our source, a communion of some kind, a yoga, a linking, a binding together, a reconnecting as well. The word religion, religio, means to reconnect. So many people don't like religion because they think of institutions. We think of religion instead as a kind of experience that links us back to our source. Then we're all like religion, really. Um, but such men are few. Such, such individuals are few. There are few people who are not being controlled by this wheel. Remember the planets in Indian astrology called grahas or grabbers, the, the wandering planets uh, in, in the Greek tradition, both thought of as things that deviate us, take us in all different kinds of directions. And it's not to say that the dramas of this world aren't interesting right? They're very interesting. They're very compelling, which is why we get so invested in them. Um, but it's a, different, it's, a, it's a different script. We get into a totally different kind of stagecraft when we start asking, how can I spiritualize my life? What does that look like? Hermes says at last that um, uh, we should not just acquiesce to the human state and stay on that wheel, that we should contemplate defined things and naturally detach ourselves from things that are doing nothing for us. So Hermes really, you know, he's really preaching in this part, but this is so important because this is the, see in the picture on the slide, the astrologer is the one who's living in the world, but suspects that there's something more. He says, you know what, something about this world is like a, a play and all the plot lines are somewhat predictable. You know, and I'm somewhat predictable, but I, am I not something more than this? And so he peers through the veil to start understanding the celestial movements of the gods, of the heavens, of karma, of goddess destiny, of necessity, of karmic law. And we also, through that process, reach into who am I really? And how can, I, how can my life become spiritualized? That's what astrology is actually about even though we study what's my monthly horoscope what's the forecast how's that eclipse season going to affect me all of that stuff it's the contemplation of these things over time that starts developing within our hearts a sense of being in communion with something and when this is paired with other devotional lifestyle practices that's when we really start to to shift uh, our awareness of who we are and what we find out in future chapters coming up 
like the universal and the particular, as well as the incarnation of the soul, is we start, we start to realize, Hermes starts to tell us what happens when we take up a spiritual lifestyle. What is the process of spiritual evolution that starts to occur? Even the word evolution isn't really the right word. It, it's sometimes way too linear. Uh, but we, we're going to find out in the next couple of chapters to come uh, what happens when we start shifting our consciousness like this. So that's what I've got for you this time around. I hope this was interesting. As always, I hope it was good food for thought. And I hope it takes your astrological studies and interests just a little bit deeper. And uh, tell me what you think. Leave your comments and uh, feel free to shoot me email with any follow-up questions at nightlightastrology at gmail.com. Okay, take care. Bye.